On today's program, I interview Peter Kling. Peter Kling is considered to be the Einstein of biblical prophecy. He's the author of Letters to Earth, The Future is Yours. To learn more about Peter Kling, visit peterkling.com. On a recent program, I interviewed Erica Gray. Erica Gray is an evangelical Christian specializing in end-time prophecy. She challenged Peter Kling to a debate on this program regarding rapture. She believes it. He doesn't. Peter has declined the offer. This show is his official answer regarding the debate and his thoughts on the rapture. Like the video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, and enjoy the show. Peter, yesterday I had Erica Gray on the program. She's an evangelical. And I asked her what Bible was the best to use. She brought up the King James Version. Of course, they're all going to pick King James as the worst Bible on the freaking planet. Yes. Well, anyway, I mentioned that we have Peter Kling on the show all the time and that he prefers the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures and that he doesn't believe in the rapture at all, something Erica Gray believes in. The, the, but there is no Bible on the face of the planet that's got the word rapture in it. That's that's a fact. That's a fact. The word rapture does you cannot find it in any Bible. So where do they come up with this idea? It, it's a corrupted idea that they they, they twist the, again. They cherry pick the words. There's only a select group, 144,000 that are specifically numbered that leave the planet and become ra uh, rulers with Christ or with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, the, the last of them just happened to be my mentors. And that's a sealed number. There's, there's 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of, of Israel, essentially. However, you have to have a better understanding than just they're not all Israelites. Uh, when you look at the scriptures, Peter was given uh, first the keys to the kingdom, but then he has these two visions. One is uh, all these unclean foods being put before him, and he's commanded to eat. And it's like, well, well I can't eat this. This is all unclean. And the Lord tells him, are you going to call unclean what I, have, what I have made clean and told you to consume? And But it, it, it was a vision for him to look at the, the nations and then take the message to the nations. Because Jesus, except for the uh, the one account with the Samarians by the well, the Samarian woman brought her friends back. But besides that, Jesus never spoke to anybody who wasn't Hebrew. His whole time was spent, uh, in the, the three and a half years of his preaching was all directed to the Jews, because all the prophecies were directed to the Jews, and they had first had right of first refusal for the Abrahamic covenant, which they took full advantage of. There was only 120,000 faithful Jews at Pentecost, far from the number of 144,000. So that's when the keys were, were, were essentially, that's when the preaching work then went to the nations, and they were invited to become part of that select group. But it's still only 144,000. When you're raptured, you're going to leave a dead body behind. So, see ya. Have fun. Have a good trip. <laughs> what, what, what happened to the, you know, where, where, where do these people, they have very little knowledge of the scriptures. So when they reject uh, scriptures that says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So what do they think is going to happen with their body? You know, hey, you want to believe you're raptured? You're going to leave a dead body behind, that's all. It's just that simple. Uh, there's, it was basically, and it became part of biblical, or it became part of church doctrine, not biblical doctrine, but part of church doctrine. And it was, um, it was championed by, well, I sent you the, the link uh, yesterday, John Nelson Darby first proposed the popularization of the pre-tribulation rapture in 1827. And so, because he said it was so, everybody else says it's so, when the word isn't even mentioned in the scriptures, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing to debate. 
Some are saying the event is predicted and described without the term rapture in Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians in the Bible 1 Thessalonians 4.17. 4.17, yes, where he says, uh, shucks, hold on. For first Thessalonians, afterward we the living who are surviving will together with them be caught up in away in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. However, at this juncture, they still didn't have 144,000. So everybody that was being spoken to at that time was going to be part of this group that would indeed reign with Christ. What they tend to, to forget here again, when you go to, to Revelation, the seventh chapter, where it gives the number of, of those, let me bring this up real quick. goes down 12,000 uh, 12, out of each one of the 12 tribes and, and goes down through to verse 9 where it says, And after this I saw, and look, a great crowd which no man was able to number out of all the nations, all the tribes, and all the tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, dressed in white robes, and there were palm branches in his hands, and they kept shouting out with a voice saying, Salvation we owe to our God and the one seated on the throne of the Lamb. Why are 144,000 sealed? It starts off in verse 4. It says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. So you, it names all the 12, the 12 tribes with 12,000 sealed. And then it goes to this great crowd of other people. It's two distinct separate groups. Now, the other situation is, is that it all goes contrary to the prime directive, which was put out in Genesis, the first chapter. Be fruitful, become many, and fill the earth with perfect human living children of God. And then it all gets dissemin or it gets destroyed after that though, because of what we could call extraterrestrial interference. How's that? Instead of alien. E.T. does not have to be three-dimensional, nor is he. Are they? They're interdimensionals. And so there's a difference there. I don't believe that any other intelligent physical life, such as we humans are, exist within our physical universe. Personal opinion. Other life forms, animal type life forms, oh yeah, there's, like I said, hundreds of thousands of planets which are ready to be inhabited. Probably billions of planets. But when we look at the scriptures, the original purpose was for humans to fill the earth with other perfect human children or human beings. And that has never been accomplished. So for God to yank everybody, all, all the good people off the planet and then destroy all the bad people goes totally contrary to what happens in, in uh, Genesis, the, the first chapter. They totally invalidate the rest of the scriptures. And so what's the purpose? You know, who, who are those when you go beyond uh, Revelation 19? It says that there would be a, a resurrection, that the, the sea would give up the, the dead in it, and the, those in the graves would, would be, uh, the graves would be given up the dead in them, and they would be put back on the earth for what? For one final test. So they're not raptured off the, or they're, they're not resurrected off the planet. They're resurrected right back on earth. They're, they're given... Uh, physical bodies and their soul is put in that body, just as uh, we have the soul within our physical vessel. That's why they can put us under admiralty law, because they separate the soul from the physical human vessel. Just a, just a quick sidebar here. Sure. What are your thoughts on reincarnation? Not a big fan of reincarnation either. Like there are more bodies than souls. Yeah, well, that yeah, exactly. What what happens here? All of a sudden, we keep on getting more bodies because people, you know, you, you have kids, I have kids, my kid, our kids have kids, those kids have kids. So so wait a minute. Uh, now we're dealing with reincarnation. Now, if we just started with the two, Adam and Eve, that means that they would only need two souls to reincarnate back into, or two bodies to reincarnate back into. And the whole premise of reincarnation is to continue your physical journey. Again, goes contrary. It, it's it's an Eastern philosophy or an Eastern teaching that has been adopted by 
the Western belief system because the church has failed the people so miserably. That's how New Age religion got started. Is people were looking for answers. And they weren't finding the ans logical answers inside the church. And so they started adopting Eastern philosophies, you know, whatever made sense. And New Age religion has basically been replaced by Gnosticism, which was the apostasy or the, well, it was the apostasy or the, the Antichrist system that uh, appeared after the apostles all died. The Gnostics spring up in the second and third century, and their writings, while they don't all go contrary to scripture, there's a lot of differences there, especially the biggest difference is, is that the, the Gnostics say that Jesus was a, a prophet, he wasn't the son of God, and that he never died, uh, or was never impaled for our sins. He never gave up his life for our sins, and that you know somebody else died in his place. Well, gee, that sounds a lot like Islam, doesn't it? Because it says the same thing in the Quran. Jesus was a great prophet, but not as great as Muhammad. And he didn't die for our sins. Well, that's, that's a Gnostic teaching. And that's infiltrated, as a matter of fact, with most people's belief systems, that they have taken totally the, the satanic side of the, of the Gnosticism and have, have left out uh, Jesus because Jesus and Yahweh aren't cool anymore. It's not cool to be a Christian. So we've got a lot of a lot of divided minds on on things and every see here's the thing once you start to debate religious dogma or doctrine that's how you wind, wind up with over 43,000 different flavors of Christendom there's over 43,000 different sects of what Christ taught and none of them not one single one of them I bet has it right okay and this is why you would not debate Eric Gray on this program, correct? I wouldn't debate it. I wouldn't debate anybody on religious doctrine. Yeah, not just her specifically. Yeah, not just not that I have anything. I don't even know who she is, but that's that's besides the point. You're arguing religious dogma and doctrine that has no basis in Christianity, if you want to call it that, because Jesus never taught about a religion. Who goes to church and he can get the political commentary on the future? Because Jesus spoke about a kingdom. He never said, "I came to." Uh, create a new religion or start a new religion. He died a Jew following the Mosaic law to the letter. When he spoke about the future, he spoke about his coming kingdom, a literal kingdom. Now look around this planet today and with everything that's going on, we are obviously under a satanic system of evil. Just look at all the injustice. You've got people who are supposed to be the rulers and servants to the public are the most corrupt individuals on the planet. You know, they, they, they do the most terrible things and they're involved in the, in the worst crimes against humanity. And I'm not even talking about starting wars, just child trafficking. Human trafficking is, is a huge, huge business. 35 million people a year are, are involved in, are the victims of human trafficking. So who's responsible? Obviously the governments are because they're not stopping it. Go look, go, go to Bangkok and you'll see more human trafficking in one afternoon, I'm sure, than most people will see in a total lifetime. Because all those people there are trafficked humans. And from what I understand, you can go over there now and buy yourself a kid and go have sex with a kid, boy or girl. doesn't make any difference. You got the money. You can go get what you want. So how does this corrupt system uh, exist if it's not under some sort of evil control? And so when we look at Christ's government or the government of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we're involved in a totally different thing. It has nothing to do with religion. Have you ever considered that people aren't necessarily inherently good? If the scriptures say that themselves. I believe it's, it, it, oh, shucks, it just escapes me. The way of man, I believe it was actually Solomon that, that said it. Um, the heart of man is, is to predispose to do bad or wrong all the time. In other words, we don't have any other choice because we, we, we are stuck in the beta frame of mind. 
And when we go back to Genesis, we can actually tell you, we can identify exactly when the beta test starts. But in the, the beta re is the reactionary state where we have the fight or fight response. Beta is also where we sense fear. And that's when our brains operate or, or uh, vibrate above 13 hertz per second. 12 hertz and lower is alpha. 12 hertz down to 8 hertz is alpha. Alpha is where we experience love. Alpha is where we daydream. Alpha is where we create our futures. We relax in alpha. We, we'll do some of our deepest thinking in alpha. And if we're in alpha, we're not going to have the, the response to either fight or of flight to run away from a fight. And we're not going to experience fear in the state of alpha. And that's, it's such a simple thing. And yet people seem to need to have the desire to get one up on their neighbors, get one up on their friends. In other words, take advantage of every situation that they can to put themselves in a better place and, and destroy other people. And the further you go up on the food chain, so to speak, the greater the situation that becomes. You got one family, the Rothschild family, said to control well over five hundred trillion dollars. What do you do with that much money? Five hundred trillion dollars? You can give a lot of people a lot of money with that. But no, as a matter of fact, that one single family is probably responsible for starting almost every war on this planet for for the last two hundred years. Do the research. So, you know, we've got, we've got, we are predisposed to do evil things. It's the special person, if you want to call them that, or the unusual person that seeks the advantages of others, that is self-sacrificing today, that will help other people as a general rule. I'm not saying we're all bad. But we're all going to screw up from time to time, no matter how moral we think we are. We're not perfect. So how can we be held to a perfect standard? See, that there's another misnomer. Oh, if you're bad, you're going to go to, you're going to burn in hell or a misunderstanding. That doctrine doesn't even exist in the Bible. Hell got hot when the word Sheol, which means common grave in uh, Hebrew, was translated into Hades in Greek. The New Testament, what is commonly called the New Testament, is also referred to as the, the Hebrew Greek or the uh, Aramaic Greek scriptures or the Hebrew Greek scriptures or Christian Greek. I'm sorry, Christian Greek scriptures. So the common language of that day, of that time of the first century wasn't Roman, it wasn't Hebrew, it was Greek. Everybody spoke Greek. And so that was the first language that the, the Bible will, or say that uh, letters were transposed into so that they could be under, understood by the general populace as, you know, that, that teaching work began. But it was never religious. When did it get to be religious? Emperor Constantine, when he married the Church of Rome. Well, basically what he did is he, he t took Mithra worship and gave it Christian names. Gave it a, he, Mithra is a pagan god and he's typically known as the pagan Jesus. And so when people go to church, they're not worshiping Christ. They're actually worshiping Mithra. He's a sun deity, a sun god. And that's why you see the sunburst behind the cross. That's why they have that little uh, stand where they put the host in and hold it up. It's a sunburst. Even the, the bread wafer that the Catholics give as communion, that is a, that disc is a symbol of the sun. S-U-N, not S-O-N. So while everybody believes that they're worshiping the dead man on a stick, there's always the starburst or the sunburst behind them. And that's the real God that they are worshiping. And it goes right back to ancient Samaria. He, he, yeah, I guess we love it. Uh, I got somebody else calling in. Excuse me, never mind. <laughs> but uh, the uh, people just start this dogma. They, they cherry pick something. 
they twist the scripture, they make it part of, of religious dogma, and then they hang their hope on it. And I, I love the, the scripture that's in Matthew where Jesus, where the crowds are asking Jesus, uh, or the, the ministers, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we heal in your name? And goes on, you know, list a bunch of different things. And Jesus' response is, get away from me, you workers of lawlessness, for I certainly do not know who you are. So these were supposed to be, quote, those who were doing things in Jesus' name. And yet Jesus rejected them. The other side of the coin is with all the religious dogma and all the religious doctrine, uh, why debate it? Because according to Revelation 17 and 18, religion gets destroyed. That It refers to Babylon the Great as uh, the mother of the harlots. Now, when we do our uh, historic research, because you can't find this in the, in the scriptures, you got to go back to the actual history books. What we find is that we come across the cradle of civilization, Samaria, ancient Samaria. And what do we learn about the ancient Samarians is that the leader or the king of the ancient Samarians, the first king, was Nimrod. He does get a short mention in the scriptures, two sentences long. Uh, but that's it. Doesn't go into any of the history. What the secular history says is that Nimrod finds this woman on the way home from one of his campaigns. Her name is Seriamis. She's a prostitute. He takes her back and he makes her his queen. She conspires against him, over, overthrows, uh, or actually has him murdered, and takes over the empire. So we have all of these, you have this historical account, and what we find is that Nimrod becomes the first sun god king. Syriamis becomes goddess of the earth, moon, and stars. And after she has Nimrod murdered, she becomes pregnant. And she claims that the child is Nimrod incarnate, to come, who has come back to be with his people. And she names the child Tammuz. So this harlot of ancient Babylon is the uh, person who is portrayed in Babylon the Great, the Great Harlot. There's a correlation right back there. Now, all religions on the face of the planet can directly trace their roots right back to ancient Samaria. That's why it's called the current, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, cradle of civilization. It goes right back to there. That's why you have cuneiform writing on artifacts that they find in Mesoamerica, which talk about Jesus as being the son of God. And where did cuneiform writing originate? Samaria. How did it get there? Well, maybe it had something to do with when God confused the languages and told them to scatter across the planet. They took their religion with them. The two oldest religions are sun worship and serpent worship. I don't care what religion it is, it's based on either sun worship or serpent worship. And they are the two oldest religions on the planet. So, why debate a satanic system of order that's going to be destroyed? Revelation 17 and 18 are very specific. As a matter of fact, in Revelation 18, I believe it's verse 4, uh, it, where Yahweh himself says, Get out of her, my people, if you do not want to share in her sins. Speaking of Babylon the Great. 50% of the people that used to go to church don't go to church anymore. They got out. Catholic church. I should say Christian churches are down. Their, their attendance is down 50% from what it used to be years ago. So people are, are waking up. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that they talk about as far as hellfire, I'll go back to that. When the word Sheol was translated into Hades, it, the, the church took advantage of the uh, original Hades, uh, the god of Hades, who was the god of the underworld, who tortured people and burned them in uh, a fiery lake. But that's part of Greek mythology has nothing to do with the scripture. Oh, what about the, the lake that burns with salt with uh, sulfur? Yeah, what about it? 
it's uh, not a literal lake because what is thrown in there uh, is the wild beast, the false prophet, and it says even death itself was thrown into the lake that burns with sulfur and fire. So how do you torment death? You don't. You end it. You end it completely. When you burn something, the only thing that is left is ash, and there's no way to reconstruct what has been burned. You have to replace it. And so that is what will happen to those the way that this system operates, the system that we're under right now. This system is going to pass away. Those who are doing evil will be the ones that are removed, essentially. And those who are doing their best to follow one simple little law that Jesus gave, one simple little commandment that we can't seem to, to follow, and you can't twist this one. Every church on the planet, should, at least the Christian ones, should be banging this into people's head with the Bibles that are in front of them that they never open to read. And that is the greatest commandment. You must love Yahweh your God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and you must love each other like you do yourself, or you must love your neighbor, actually, as you do yourself. Love puts us in the alpha state where we cannot respond to that beta fight or flight. Very simple. And love comes naturally for us. Love is something that, that we enjoy. We love being in the state of love. Go through a bad, you know, bad relationship, you break up, and it's like, oh, you're depressed. And I'm never going to meet a woman like this again, or I'm never going to meet a guy like that again. He was so nice. Why'd you break up in the first place? Well, he broke up with me. I still love him, whatever the case might be. You know, we miss that. We miss that, uh, th that feeling when we don't have it. And so, you know, what is the problem with uh, cultivating that feeling toward other people and toward our creator itself? Why don't churches do that? Why do churches mislead people down paths of, oh, well, if you're not raptured, you're going to burn in hell, be destroyed with this system. What happened to those who endure to the end shall be saved? Not those who are plucked off the planet before the destruction is brought upon this system of evil. Let's talk about the image of heaven, Peter. We've talked about hell and how it got hot, and I think people are visualizing Dante's version of hell. And if Dante's Inferno, yeah. That, that's, you, you know, I'll tell you, here, before we leave hell, how hell became popular in the church is because it drew people in remember that there was no tv there was no movies back then part of going to church was entertainment how many people like horror flicks lots lots of people love to be scared so people were going to church to learn about this doctrine of hell and that oh they, 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 i can only imagine some of the first talks on how terrible hell was no doubt based after greek mythology doesn't exist if we die, how do you burn the soul? How do you burn something that is not physical? You see, you can't. Heaven. Go ahead. Yeah, well, this idea of heaven, and again, those who are talking about the rapture, say the living and the resurrected dead will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And, you know, when you say the word heaven, you visualize clouds and angels. What would heaven really be like? We can understand heaven through string theory. String theory simply states that in order for us to exist here in these three dimensions that we believe are one, two, and three, according to the mathematics, there needs to be seven other dimensions to support our physical dimensions. So, in fact, we live in dimensions eight, nine, and ten, not one, two, and three. There are seven other spatial planes that need to support this, our three physical planes. Now, that makes sense. Now, the interesting thing, the math says that our, our physical world cannot exist without those other seven dimensional, dimensional planes. But those seven other dimensions can do just fine without us. They don't need us to exist. They can exist just by themselves. So, we go to... 
uh, fractal science, with all the life that we see on this planet, the, the vast variety of life that has been here for, what, since the Cambrian period 500 million years ago, when there was more life on Earth than ever existed since or before. Yeah, that's right. There was more variety of life during the Cambrian period 500 million years ago than exists on the planet now. There's only been extinction-level events since then. So where did all the genetic information come from? Just instantly appeared overnight? It's one of the great mysteries that science can't answer, unless you bring in the genetic engineers. But who are the genetic engineers? So we have get this heaven, these other seven dimensions that we know have to exist in order for us to be here in this three, three physical dimensions. Exactly what it's like, Russell, I can't answer that for you. Uh, my experience of those other dimensions have just been like wormholes to get to previous time periods within Earth history or time uh, time periods in future Earth history. Uh, you have to know what you're looking for in order to find it. And exactly what heaven is. Maybe heaven is one big gateway to the entire physical universe. Considering it needs to be here and it exists within the other physical dimensions. Those initial dimensions are all, according to the mathematics, they are all smaller. Those seven spatial planes are all smaller than our three-dimensional universe. So essentially, when we talk about God, yes, God is in us. God is in everything. Hence, the God particle, which is down inside the atom. So it gives it its vibrational characteristics and allows it to, through string, which also says that all energy vibrates at a preset speed and that the string is either linear or circular, like the strings on a violin or a guitar or piano, or circular, like a rubber band. You know, you can pluck a rubber band, you make it tighter, it's got a higher frequency to it. Otherwise, it just kind of goes dud, thud. So we've got mathematically is the only real understanding of what these other seven spatial planes consists of. Besides that, you know, we've got the theory that heaven is everything out there above us. Well, we're still in the physical world. And yet these beings that are recorded in the scriptures, as a matter of fact, you go to the book of Enoch, which is not part of the Bible, but Enoch says that he made contact with these beings who had the ability to turn from uh, the form of fire to the form of man and back to the form of fire. What's fire? Energy. A type of energy. Remember, they didn't have technological terms back then that we do today. So I would imagine maybe they were orbs, energy orbs, or maybe they kept their physical form. Don't know. Enoch just said they changed from fire to man and back to fire. So what we're dealing with is something really unknown. We don't have the answers to it. So we can't say, I'll tell you what heaven isn't. Heaven isn't a bunch of clouds where an old man with a white beard lives and he loves to hear harp music. You know, that is not heaven. Heaven is where, essentially, when you, we look at what is considered heaven within the scriptures, it is where there exists a higher level of beings and our creator, the source of all energy. It gives very little about what goes on in heaven. It just talks about other living life forms that exist there. That's about it. So paint any picture you want. We ain't going. We're stuck here in the third dimension, at least in the physical form, because and I'll say it again. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Not my words, in the scriptures. So all you folks who believe in the rapture, keep in mind you're going to leave a lot of dead bodies around. When you say you won't debate it, you're saying it's my way or the highway. And like Star Wars says, only a Sith deals in absolutes. No, I'm, I'm not saying it's my way or the highway. I'm saying that it's so... Okay, I'll give you something else I won't debate. I won't debate a flat earth. 
I'll put forth the evidence that I've got as a scientist on why the Earth couldn't be flat, but I'm not going to sit here and debate why. You know, as soon as you turn around and, and talk about any any kind of satellite imagery from NASA, all of a sudden it's a lie, you know, to people who believe a flat Earth. But yet I've seen the curvature of the Earth myself, or I've experienced it on a trip to, to out west. Going across Colorado, I watched all of a sudden, boom, there's a little bump on the horizon. It was Pike's Peak. And another two hours, I was we were in downtown Denver where we could see everything. But it all came from the top down. First we saw Pikes Peak, then we saw all the tops of the other of the Rocky Mountain Range, and then eventually we could start to see the higher buildings uh, in Denver the, of the Denver City skyline. And it didn't make any difference whether I was looking through my telescopic lens that I put on my camera, or whether I was just looking with my eyes. You could only see the top coming down. So we were actually uh, experiencing the curvature of the Earth. The same thing with the Ver Verrazano and Narrows Bridge, one of the longest bridges in uh, in the United States. The bottom of the bridge and the top of the bridge, uh, the, the bases and the tops, uh, are at a slight angle on purpose to make up for the curvature of the Earth. It's only a few centimeters, but they had they had to calculate it in. So why would I debate a flat Earth when I don't believe that a flat Earth could possibly even physically exist, nor do the models show that it exists? The models all indicate that the Earth is a sphere. We look at every other planet in the universe or every other star in the universe, and they're all spherical. So you're going to tell me that God said, oh, well, let's conf confound everybody and let's make Earth a flat disk and put a dome over the top of it and paint some stars on it and let the sun and the moon revolve around the surface. Earth's the only one in the whole entire universe that is flat. That's insane. We can't compare the idiocy of the flat Earth to the rapture. Though. I can because that's how I view it. It's dogma. It's made up baloney. A lot of people believe it, just like the flat Earth. So I'm not going to stand here and debate debate something that's not right. Now, if we want to talk about uh, alien life forms, UFOs, you want to talk about global warming, yeah, we can debate certain things about that on what's causing it because we can see the effects from this. Uh, aliens, you can take all the, all the physical evidence that uh, we have from aliens, or extraterrestrials, and guess what? You can stick it inside of a shoebox and lose it because none exists. The only thing that might exist, uh, which would indicate that aliens, another alien species is around, is the skull from the star child. But yet, I've not seen any conclusive uh, results or DNA results out of that skull that, it, that give a, a link to where it is. Uh, as far as I know, it does have human, uh, uh, human mitochondrial DNA, but that's from the female side. They don't have any explanation for DNA on the male side. I'm not an expert in it, but that does raise a question. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be willing to debate anything. I'll debate the difference between Trump and, and Clinton. Clinton's a crook. I thought Trump's at least somewhat of a businessman. You know, but to, to debate, you know, it, it's like I'd rather debate a movie, <laughs> and that's a fantasy. You know, did you like it or didn't you like it? What did you like about it? But it's not that there's a fear of it. It's just that it's to me it's ludicrous. Why would I debate something that I think is ludicrous? You know, I, I disagree with a lot. I disagree with religion. I disagree with religion as a whole. Because they don't teach the scriptures. And what they do is cherry pick what's there and then twist the meaning. And they, they've sold it to almost 2 billion people. 43, over 43,000 different sects of Christianity. All splitting hairs on what Jesus said. Are you serious? Why do you think I stick to science? At least science, I might be able to prove something. You can't prove anything with dogma. If you could, there would only be a few different sects of Christianity, not forty-three, not over 43,000. So, you, you know, I, I think I've got a legitimate reason for not wanting to discuss religious dogma. There's no basis for it. 
just like a flat earth. There's no basis for it. The only basis for a flat earth is people saying, oh, it's a conspiracy. It's all a lie. We're told no lie. Look, the earth's flat. Because why? You're so stinking small. You're smaller than a, a, a bacterium on, on a flea's butt that's biting the dog. And you have no clue that you're really on a dog. Come on. You know, you got to start believing a little bit of what we see that that's put out there as far as satellite pictures of planet Earth. You got to observe some things about the Earth's curvature. The ancient Greeks figured it out over 2,000 years ago. The church wanted to kill people who thought the Earth was round. Or who, who I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the Earth was spherical and the sun revolved around the Earth. That was a big one. When Copernicus figured out that the sun revolved around the Earth, he was charged with heresy. Really? The Earth's not the center of the universe? And it's, come on, the Earth's got to be the center of the universe. It's got to be a flat domed Earth because it says so all over the place. Even the ancient uh, Anunnaki said it was flat. Anu was a god over a flat domed Earth. Yeah. Aren't those the guys that gave us religion and government to begin with? Yeah, the cradle of civilization given to us by the Anunnaki. It doesn't seem like they've done us a lot of good. So where do you want to debate it? You know, it's like, why debate something that's not worth debating? I want to get to the truth. I want to find the reality. And what the indication is within the scriptures, if they would read their entire Bible instead of cherry picking a scripture here or there, when you get to Genesis, when you get to Revelation, the 21st chapter, it talks about earth be well, actually it starts in the 20th chapter, but it talks about the finalization where humans are brought back to perfection, where the quote, tent of God is with mankind, not we are with him, he is with us, where mourning and pain are outcry and death will be no more. The former things have passed away. We are when we go back and we look at the prime directive, the whole reason for that thousand year rule of Jesus was to bring the earth back into specification to meet the prime directive in order for the humans on this planet to take our next step. It's just that simple. And the end of the Bible talks about in Genesis, the 20, I'm sorry, Revelation, the 22nd chapter, it says new scrolls would be opened. That would be, we would be taught new things. What are those new things? Here's a couple of things, a couple of notes to leave on. Every healthy human female is born with over 400,000 eggs in her ovaries. Every human healthy male, once they start producing sperm, they never stop until the day they die. For a woman passing one egg every month, to use those eggs all up, she would have to live 35, over 35,000 years. Think about that for a second. If she used one egg a year, well, the math's easy. She'd have to live over 400,000 years. She'd have to live a half million years. That's insane. Not if we had perfect human DNA, it wouldn't be. Humans are the perfect breeding machines for, for populating planets. Think about that. If we didn't die, we would be the perfect breeding machines to populate planets. And that indeed is our future. As it says in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the earth, created the heavens too. But earth was labeled as the beginning. Why was earth singled out? Why was earth beta tested? You see, when we, once we start to put Genesis and string all the scriptures together and start looking at all the intervention that's been going on by other life forms that have visited this planet other than human, and the Bible's full of them. The Bible is essentially 6, 000, a 6,000-year record of alien intervention in human affairs or extraterrestrial intervention in human affairs. And so that's exactly what we find right up until the end. And then at the end we are essentially brought into harmony with the prime directive. So to be raptured off the planet goes totally contrary to biblical, to, to what the whole teaching of uh, is of the scripture. They pick out a few scriptures like you had said 
uh, misapply them. Hey, isn't it nice that everybody can go to heaven? We don't have to experience this great tribulation that Jesus said if those days weren't cut short, no flesh would be saved. But on account of the chosen ones, those days would be cut short. Matthew 24, 21, go look it up. Why did he want people to be saved on the earth? Why would he cut the tribulation short? To save those people. Why? Because they followed the greatest commandment. They love Yahweh their God with their whole heart, soul, and mind. They love their neighbors as they do themselves. They don't take weapons to go kill people. Maybe in self-defense, different story. But they don't they don't turn around and get involved in these different gangs and protests that we've seen around the around the United States. They care for each other. They're the ones that are preparing for this great tribulation that we're facing. They're preparing to get through the paradigm change of this, quote, God's war of Armageddon because they understand it. I don't know if you've ever had Marshall Masters on your show. Uh, he does a lot with Nibiru, Planet X, and uh, he kind of changed his tune a couple of years back. And he started talking about, yep, yeah, Nibiru and Planet X, but he included what we needed to do and what the effects would be and what, how we would be, how we could prepare for it. And his whole focus was on saving the species. He said, I'm in it for the species, not the money. I'm in it for the species. And I have to say the same thing. I'm in it for the species because there is no money in this. I, I Finally, after seven years, I sold enough books to pay for the publishing cost. I'm still thousands of dollars in the hole for advertising and other things related to book costs, let alone the time it took to write Letters to Earth, The Future is Yours. It's a, it, it's a labor of love. Russell, do you pay me to come on and talk to you, talk on your radio show for an hour or two? No. I don't pay you, Peter. Nobody does. I would appreciate if the audience, you know, go to PeterKling.com. You can make a donation sure. to Peter. He'll give you the PDF to his book. You can purchase the book, the hard copy. But no, the answer is I don't pay you. Do you want money, Peter? <laughs> we can all use money. I'd be a fool if I said I didn't want money because I do have bills to pay. But... The money isn't the situation. The money isn't why I do this. Why I do this is so uh, there's a great crowd from every nation, every tribe, every tongue that will get through the paradigm shift and live in harmony after and become part of that kingdom of Jesus or the kingdom of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that will rule right here on planet Earth. I don't want to have to restore this planet by myself. The more hands, the better. And that's the whole thing. We, we are commissioned to restore this planet back to its original design. And in the process, we ourselves will be restored back to the original design. It's not that complicated. The truth never is. It makes more sense to look at it that way. This is our home. Why would God put us here only to take us off? Oh, you're the good people. I'm going to take you off planet Earth and destroy the whole thing. Everything that I made, we're just going to destroy. Now, what are we going to do with you good people? Well, since you can't inherit uh, God's kingdom in the flesh, we've got to leave your flesh behind. And then you can all come to heaven and be with us. Play your harp. So we like harp music up here. Come on. How many people love the planet? Love to get out and enjoy nature. This is our home. Russell, as you brought up and I agreed with, we are designed after this planet. This planet gave birth to us, essentially. It gave birth to every living thing on this planet. And the planet itself is alive. And we're in the process of killing the planet. Through pollution and other means. So, give up the dogma. Stay on Earth. Enjoy life. Love one another. Love our creator. Love the planet that's around, that, that keeps us living. Stay in that state of love and we'll have very little issue getting through the paradigm change. Nope, we ain't getting raptured off. Yep, we'll be here after it's all over. 
and so will our children and great-grandchildren and their great-grandchildren right on up until it's time for us to populate other planets in this galaxy and then within the universe itself. That's where we're headed. Earth is only the beginning. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you very much, Russell, for having me on once again. And I hope I was able to bring a little truth into people's lives. Uh, it's not complicated. And it all goes, it all deals with love. And I explain this all in Letters to Earth. The future is yours. Once we can create a compelling future, we'll have no reason to leave. Love and blessings.